Well, I made it through the first week. <laughs> uh, if, if you are here with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, I'm the new guy. And so I've been here for a week. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Stephen, and I'm glad that you're here, whether you're in here, in the room, or online. Thank you for joining us, and we're just excited uh, to start this new season together. I wanted to uh, take you back a little bit, and several years ago, when I was just a young guy and been married just a few years, uh, my wife was entering lots of contests. Um, and so she would enter contests all the time online and in the mail. And I'll be frankly honest, I kind of thought that it was lame because no one ever wins those, right? I mean, yeah, it's lots of heads, not, you just don't. And we would get these, you know, you'd get some sometimes and they would come in the mail and they would say like, you know, you've won a million dollars. We're like, yeah, right, whatever. But something happened. We got in the mail or email, I don't remember how it was, uh, a notice that we had won an all expense paid trip to Cancun. And I thought, it's not real. It's a scam. It's not real. There's no way that would happen. And my wife, uh, she is an optimist, and I am the pessimist in the, in the family. And she's like, no, no, this is legit. This thing is legit. We won this trip. All expense paid. And I thought for sure there's no way this is true. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get there, and uh, they're going to bill us uh, for, for this and this and this. And she's like, no, it's real. And I just wouldn't believe that this was really something that was happening to us, that this gift was something that we could trust. Even as getting on the airplane, I was like, they're going to send us a bill for this. I know they are. <laughs> but lo and behold, guess who was right? She was right, yeah. We enjoyed this amazing trip, all expense paid, the airfare and the lodging and the food and all this stuff. It was 100% real. It was this gift that I thought was fake that was really real. But I didn't believe it. And I think that that happens to us in life many times. We have gifts that we just don't want to believe are real. Well, last weekend we talked about this idea of leaning back and kicking forward. And the illustration of a swing is again seen in this new series that we're starting today called Foundations. See, as we start this new season as a church, or even students and teachers, we prayed for them this morning, start a new season, we're leaning back into our identity, into who we are, and we're going to kick forward out of that identity with the momentum that we have from that into all the blessings that God has for us. We're leaning back, and, and that's what we build our life on, is that foundation. Those things that we just, just ring true about who we are. And if we don't have a foundation that's solid, then the future is not going to be what it's intended to be. And before we jump in, I want you to pull out your handout. If you got a bulletin this morning, uh, there's a sheet of paper in there. Looks like this. It says foundations at the top, and you got to tear it out of that and get the sticky off. And I want to just walk through this really quick. This has two sides to it. The first side has got some discussion questions, a study guide for you. And this is an opportunity for you uh, to really dig into the passage. And I encourage you uh, to take a look at this during the week, whether by yourself, whether with your family, uh, your small group, whatever it might be. And these questions will give you some more insight into diving into this passage. And the other side has the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. And this is what we're going to be starting a six-week series on today, on the book of Ephesians. And so I want to issue to you what we're calling the foundation challenge. You'll see it up around the screen. The first part of this challenge is that you would read a chapter of Ephesians every week. There are six chapters. There are six weeks to that series. See how that worked out? And so each week, we ask you to read one chapter. So this week, you'd read the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Now, that's not very long. You can read each of these chapters in just a few minutes, but I encourage you, part of that challenge is to read a chapter of Ephesians each week. And if you like bonus extra credit points, some of you guys starting school like extra credit points, here's your extra credit. Read a chapter every day. Read the same chapter every day. So this week, you'll read the book, the first chapter of Ephesians from now till next week. But I encourage you at least once, read that chapter this week. And the second part of that challenge is to work through this study guide, whether alone, with some friends, with your small group, whatever it might be. And as we start this book of Ephesians, this study on Ephesians, we need to know who wrote it. Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote it while he was on house arrest. 
He wrote this and many other letters to these churches that weren't just intended for the church in Ephesus, which was a major metropolitan area. It wasn't just for their church. It was for us as well. And we're going to see how this letter from Paul affects us today as well. So Ephesians is broken down into two sections, two main sections. Again, this kind of mirrors our idea of a swing. The first section, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are, is Paul encouraging us to lean back, to lean back into the truth of who we are in Christ, to lean back into the truth of who we are in Christ. In the second section of Ephesians, chapters four, five, and six are all about kicking forward, how based off of who we are in Christ, how we kick forward into how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to be as believers. And I think Paul wrote this way and followed this format of leaning back, kicking forward for a reason. See, he knew that if we didn't have a firm grasp on who we are in Christ, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter if we do the right things if our life is based on a foundation that isn't secure. See, being a Christian isn't just about following rules. It's about living a different kind of life. And our life needs to have the right foundation if we're going to be able to do all that God calls us to do. Now, if you're a parent, you understand that at a certain age, you hope your kids start doing the right thing for a reason other than because I told you so. How many of you have ever used that phrase in your house before? Because I told you so, yeah. At some point, I mean, that, that's good, and sometimes it motivates kids uh, to the right behavior and to follow the rules, but at some point, the dream, the hope of all of us as parents is that our kids will make a decision based on something other than because we told them so. That they'll do that, they'll make the right decisions, not because they're afraid of punishment or because we told them so, but because at the core of their identity, they've leaned back into who they are, and who they are is now informing the decisions that we're making. That they're making the right decisions for the right reasons. So David Loomis in his book on identity said this because the choices that we make they flow out of our identity in his, his book he said this as a definition for the word identity he said your identity is the truest thing about you the truest thing about you but here's the catch it might not even be true See, we form our identity based on what we think is the most true about us. We think it's the most true, even if it's not true. And many of us are walking around with what we can understand are false identities. Things about us that we're holding in, that we're leaning back into, that just aren't true. Some of us have carried around these fake IDs since we were kids. Maybe they were given to us by our parents. They said, You're so funny. Or, you're such a slob. Or, or they were formed among our peers in school on the recess. In recesses, we were picked last for the games or picked first for the games. These IDs were given to us when we were struggling in math class, and our teacher said, you're just not very smart. Or, when we succeeded and we got straight A's, people told us, you're so smart, you're going to be a doctor. Or we didn't make the cut for the audition and we were told, you just don't have any talent. You're just not talented or someone made fun of our looks. Now see, some of these identities are not wrong. They're not untrue, but they're not who we are. But they become our identity. We lean back into those and our decisions are outpourings of who we think we are. They cripple us and they hold us back from who God wants us to be. They become a foundation that we build our life on that's faulty. And these identities run deep. And they interact how we work with each other, how we treat our spouse, our children, our parents, our coworkers, how we act here at church. And my prayer is today that as we dive into the book of Ephesians, that we'll understand at a greater level, that you'll leave here knowing more about your identity than when you came in that you'll understand at your core who you are and who God has made you to be. As we start this new season together as a church, as students, as teachers, we have to have the right foundation, the right mindset to recognize all that God has created us to be. 
So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible, you can just follow along on this piece of paper. It works great that way, or you can look at the screen. And I encourage you to keep this paper out if you want to, because uh, we're going to take some notes, and I'm going to guide you through some things to write. And if you're like me, I sometimes have a hard time writing in my Bible. And so this is just a sheet of paper you could write on. But let's start reading the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us before the cre- chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to be put our hope, in, our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Whew. He just gets so excited. He just ramps it up. In the original Greek, this whole passage we just read there is one long sentence. The entire thing. It's the world's longest run on sentence. Paul would have gotten a D minus in English class. But he's just so excited he can't stop talking about who we are in Christ. And so he just goes on and on. Now, obviously, in our English translation, we've added punctuation and periods and all that to help us to read it. But Paul's just so excited. And your Bible probably has added a heading to this part of Ephesians. And it probably says something about blessings. I think that many of us have taken these amazing spiritual blessings given to us. We receive them and we just stick them in the drawer. Or like me, we just don't believe they're real. We can't possibly be given this gift. So we received an all-expense-paid trip, and we aren't claiming the prize. So if you take your hand out, let's look at these verses. And as you read, you're going to see several phrases, a single phrase, really, that keeps popping up. And it's the phrase, in him, or its equivalent, in Christ, or in love. And you'll find this phrase about 11 times just in this passage. And you can find them. You can circle them. Uh, they don't have a prize, and maybe you could do that after the message. Or if you're getting bored right now, you can do it now. But Paul uses this phrase, in him, 11 times in this passage. About 30 times in this letter to Ephesians. And there are some commentators that, somebody counted this, I will be honest, it wasn't me, it says that Paul uses this phrase, in Christ, over 200 times in his letters. It's something important that he says over and over again. And he wants us to understand it. And what does this phrase mean? It's obviously important to Paul. And we're going to look at this phrase as we study the book of Ephesians. But I heard this illustration. I like to think of it like you're baking a cake. And you, you're the cake mix. A bunch of ingredients stuck in this box in the cake mix. But it's not a cake. We'll forever be just a box of cake mix until we add some other ingredients. So you might add eggs and water and oil to your cake mix. And only then do you get a cake. But I'm not a baker, but I know that you can't just take your cake mix and stick an egg on top of it and some oil on top of it and have a cake. You've got to mix it in. In Christ. When you mix these things together, you no longer can see the cake mix or the egg or the oil. It becomes an amazing cake. And Paul wants us to understand that our lives are in Christ. They're no longer us and Christ, but Christ in us, permeating it, mixed together. 
So every time you see that phrase, he wants to remind us that our life has to be more than just church and, and work and school. That in Christ, Christ is in us, we're no longer able to be separated. We can't separate these aspects of our life. And it becomes, we become something better, something new. Now there's a church word for this, and it's a word sanctification. Becoming more in Christ our life integrated with who Jesus is. Now, several scholars have given this passage that we just read in Ephesians. They say this is a great picture of the work of the Trinity. Now, if you're not familiar with what the Trinity is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, three in one. Aspects of God. And we see in this passage the blessings that come, the work that is done by the Trinity. So if you, I want you to take out your, your paper here, and you'll see it up on here on the screen. I want you to bracket off verses 3 through 6. Verse 3 through 6 show us the work, the blessings of the Father. We see the work and the blessings of the Father. And the first spiritual blessing that we see that comes from the Father is that we are chosen. You'll see that up there. For he chose us. You can circle that. It's one of the blessings, the first blessings of the Father. He says we're chosen and made holy and blameless. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel holy and blameless. My family would probably say, you don't always act holy and blameless. But it's part of the blessings. It's part of who I am. Now, notice the phrase after holy and blameless. It says, in his sight. That in God's eyes, we are holy and blameless and blameless. Some translations might say without fault. But living with our fake identities, we don't see what God sees. It's like a teenager who's awkward and gangly and views himself as such. We don't see who God has really created us to be. Take a look at this picture. Could you imagine that this little kid here, nobody thought that one day he would be a celebrity heartthrob. You see the next picture? Might know who this is? Ryan Seacrest. Or what about this one? That this guy with this haircut and those glasses would one day be considered one of the greatest looking men alive. Anybody know who that is? George Clooney. Or what about this guy? This gangly kid with braces and glasses and big ears who would thought that one day he would turn into this? Just had to put that up there. It's a bad glamour shot from a project. But God looks at us in all our awkwardness, in all our awkwardness, and he says, they're exactly who I created them to be, and I see who they will become, holy and blameless in Christ. Now, if you are familiar with the Bible and you've read this passage before, you might have said, wait a minute, when are we going to get to this big word here that I really wanted to hear today, predestination? It's a controversial word. Churches have divided over this word. And it's a great topic to drop in a room full of scholars and see what happens. If you're not familiar with the word predestination, it means to determine beforehand or to use another religious word to ordain or to predetermine. And there are two main camps on the subject of predestination, Calvinism and Arminianism. And if you want to know more about those two, Google it. I'm not going to talk about it today. But when you drop this word, predestination, it brings up all sorts of questions. Wait a minute. Did God, before the creation of the world, choose, or or sometimes translations will say elect some of us, but not all of us? Does that mean that he's already got a select chosen chosen group that is going to be saved? So maybe that, doesn't, maybe that means it doesn't really matter what I do. I mean, it's all predetermined beforehand. The whole system is rigged. You see that tension there? Whose choice is it? Did God choose me? We just read that. Or do I choose God? You'll see up here two parallel lines. And the first one represents God's sovereignty, and it extends throughout eternity. And our free will, and, and to, the, to, the, to us, to humans, and our finite wisdom. We look at these and we see two parallel lines that can't possibly intersect. The truth of God's sovereignty and the truth that we have free will. 
But here's what's amazing, and here's what this has to do with predestination. If I was to take these screens and extend them for miles and miles and miles, you would see that these two lines ever so slightly are bent towards each other. And so God's sovereignty and free will are not opposing truths. One day God aligns his sovereignty with our free will in a way that you and I just frankly can't see. The ESV study Bible says this. It says, how God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together in the world is a mystery no one can fully understand. But here's what you need to know today. God chose you. And you chose God. God chose you and you chose God, and those are both true. The Bible teaches us in several places that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So this idea of predestination, it shouldn't bring with us a feeling of exclusion, but inclusion. Pastor J.D. Greer gives an amazing illustration of this. He says, it's like the show The Voice. Have you guys seen The Voice? He says, it's like God turned his chair before he ever heard us sing. God chose us, not based on what we've done, before we ever had earned it or not earned it. He chose us. The second blessing or gift that we see from the Father is that we are adopted. You can see that on the screen in your passage as well. We're chosen and we're adopted. Now, to help us more deeply understand the significance of Paul using this word of adoption, we have to understand what adoption meant for these readers in Ephesus. See, when babies were born in Roman culture, they would present the baby before the father. And the dad at that moment would choose whether he was going to pick up that child and accept it as his own, or he had the right for any reason to walk away. Maybe he wanted a boy and it was a girl. Maybe the baby had a defect in some way. And here's what would happen to those, those babies that were discarded. They would take them out to the city gates. And there was a section in the city that was really just the place where they put the garbage. And they would put these babies there to leave them to the gods to decide what would happen to them. And people would go and p- some would pick up these children and use them for slaves or prostitution. Or sometimes parents would come, want to be parents, and pick up that child and adopt them. Have you ever been dumped by a boyfriend or girlfriend? or Maybe your spouse cheated on you, your spouse left you. Maybe you got kicked out of your job, maybe you were fired. Just let go. Maybe some of your closest friends walked out on you. So many of us know what it feels like to be abandoned. But our father, he didn't walk away. We were chosen. We were adopted. And we're adopted because we're profoundly loved. When that child was adopted in that culture, they became full heirs to what that family could provide. They became a legal heir. And adoption in that culture wasn't just for the adoptee. Because no matter who they were, when the child was adopted, they then would carry on the name of that person. So it was a blessing to them. It was their legacy. And God chose us to be his adopted child, his heir. We're adopted because we were profoundly loved. Before the creation of the world, God chose you. You weren't chosen last. You weren't chosen because you showed potential. You weren't chosen because of your looks or your status or your giftedness. You were chosen before you did anything to warrant being chosen. And you were chosen because you were loved for a purpose. We're going to get to that purpose in just a moment. Well, let's look, let's bracket off the next section of Scripture, verse 7 through 12. Verse 7 through 12 tells us the blessings that we have in the Son. In the Son, we see we have redemption, forgiveness, and an inheritance. We have a wonderful inheritance. Or depending on how the word is translated, it could be that in Christ we are an inheritance. That we're valuable to him. We're going to see that throughout this study. That we're his bride, his church, his house. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're part of this deal. 
But let's look at the first blessing we have in the Son, that we're redeemed. You can think of redemption as buying something back. It was an old slavery term. In Paul's time, a slave or captive could be made free by a payment of what was called a ransom. I want to share with you this amazing story that illustrates the power of a ransom. This happened back in the 1800s, and a young Englishman was traveling to California in search of gold. After several months, he struck it rich. And on his way home, he was stopping by New Orleans. And not long into his visit, he came across a crowd, a group of people, and they were having a slave auction. Now, he had never seen this before. That was outlawed in his country. But he'd never seen someone become someone else's property. He heard sold just as he joined the crowd. And a man was taken away. Next, a young girl was pushed up to the platform and made to walk around so everyone could see her. The man heard vile jokes and comments that spoke of evil intentions around him. Men were laughing as their eyes fixed upon this new item for sale. Within a minute, the bids surpassed what most slave owners would pay for a girl. It continued higher and higher, and it was apparent that two men really wanted her, and they laughed what they were going to do with her. The miner stood silent as anger welled inside him. And finally, the auctioneer called off going once, going twice. And just before the final call, the miner yelled out a price that was double the previous bid, a number that far exceeded what anyone would pay for a slave. People around him thought he was joking. He must want her for herself. But the auctioneer motioned for the miner to come up and show his money. The miner opened up this bag of gold. The auctioneer shook his head in disbelief and he waved the girl over. Now, the man took this woman down the street and, and went to a store and he asked her to wait outside. He went inside the store and the woman had no idea what this store was, this young girl. But she saw the miner arguing with the clerk at the desk. Finally, the clerk threw his hands up in the air and went out behind the counter and pulled out a piece of paper and both men signed it. And they walked out. The man walked out and he looked at the girl and he stretched out his hand and handed the paper to the girl and he said, here are your manumission papers. You are free. The girl did not look up. He said again, these are the papers that say you're free. She looked at them, looked at the man in the eyes and spat in his face. She said, I hate you. Why are you making fun of me? He said, no, listen. You don't understand. These are your freedom papers. You are a free person. The girl melted. She looked at the paper and saw what it was. She fell down at the man's feet crying and said, you bought me to set me free. You bought me to set me free. All I want to do is serve you because you bought me to set me free. That's an amazing story of the word redemption, of God paying the ransom for me and for you. I think many of us are like that girl. We don't believe the blessing. We don't believe that we've actually won the prize. We refuse to believe in this incredible spiritual blessing. We refuse to believe the giver. Or maybe more often, we can't accept the truth that we can be redeemed. Our false IDs take over. We can't believe that God the Father and God the Son has chosen us, that He's adopted us, that we're redeemed. We just can't believe that God would love us in that way. See, our lives are built in a foundation that's wrong, an identity that's not accurate. We have blessings from the Father. We have blessings from the Son. And now we see the blessings and the gifts given to us from the Holy Spirit. If you bracket off verses 13 and 14, you'll see these are 12, 13, and 14. You'll see these are the gifts, the blessings given to us by the Holy Spirit. And it says we're marked with a seal. Or the ESV puts it sealed with a promise. Now, this word could be uh, interpreted a couple different ways, but in this context, it means to protect. We see that this seal places an important, important protection on us. 
and that we're guaranteed something. It's like those old letters you would see when someone would write something and they would put a seal on it to close it off, to protect the contents of this. And it was a guarantee that it was authentic. See, our word today might be security or a down payment. And we're guaranteed an inheritance. We're promised, we're sealed, we're guaranteed an inheritance, a promise of what's to come. Now, I've got two amazing daughters. And on their 13th birthday for each of them, we would have a special birthday party. And we would invite their closest friends and family. And my wife and I, Angie, would present them with a gift. We presented them with a ring. And we would symbolize through this ring some important things. This ring signified that we would protect them, that we would provide for them, that we would do all we could to help them grow in wisdom and to make holy choices. It was a promise. It was a seal from Angie and I to both of them. And these girls accepting it, wearing this ring, was a symbol not only of our promise, but hers. It was a promise, a reminder, a symbol of the seal that we would care for them in that way. In these verses in Ephesians, they make up our identity, what we're supposed to lean into. They're perhaps the greatest summary in the Bible of who we are in Christ. As we're mixed in with him, this is who we are. On your own, you might be living with a fake ID, a life built in a foundation that says, that just shakes. This foundation shakes when you receive criticism or you're cut down. But in Christ, you have every spiritual blessing available to you. And when we can fully live out of the reality of these verses, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14, everything changes. You are not what you do. In Christ, you are not abandoned. You're not a cheater. You're not an addict. You're not a plumber. You're not a CEO. You're not a student. You're not a singer. You're not a doctor. You're not a stay-at-home mom. You're not a loser. You're not a liar or an idiot. You're not ugly. You're not fat. You're not dumb. You're not poor because you are rich. You're rich with these spiritual blessings. But so many of us, myself included, won't cash in on this prize. We're living out of these fake IDs. We're not tapping into the amazing power we have in our identity in Jesus Christ. But why would God give you all these blessings? What's the purpose of them? Did you catch it? We read the purpose actually three times. Here's where we see it to the praise of his glorious grace in verse 6, to the praise of glory in verse 12, to the praise of his glory in verse 14. We are chosen, we are adopted, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, we are marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit. We've been given an amazing inheritance. Why? For his glory. We're given these gifts to praise God. That's the blessing that he has in our inheritance. It's all for him. Our identity, our purpose in life, it's all to give him praise. He gives us these blessings for his glory. Think about how that shapes how you behave. When you see people living, having taken hold of these spiritual blessings, this amazing work of God, they see, when they see that in us, God is praised. They no longer see just a box of cake mix. They see the cake. They see Christ in us. And when you live your life out of this foundation, you are worshiping and giving praise to God. When your friends see you living in Christ at school, you are praising God. When your coworkers see Christ in you, you're praising God. When people look at this church, at Seymour Christian Church, do they see people who are living in Christ that our lives are actually a praise to God? Now think about this. If you choose not to accept these blessings, not to live out, to kick forward out of these blessings, you are actively robbing God of praise. 
You're stealing praise from God because he has created you to live out of this identity for his glory. Now, Paul goes on in verse 15 through 22. The rest of the chapter you see here is a prayer. And it's a prayer for us. It's a prayer that he would ask God to open the eyes of our heart, to open our eyes to see the amazing truth that he just talked about. He says, God, please help them to see this truth. He doesn't pray that God would bring that or that he would build that foundation or that he would give us those gifts. He's already given them to us. He asks that our eyes, our hearts would be open to see them, to receive them, to accept this identity, to lean back into it. And he ends this chapter by praying that for us. Prays that, that we would build our lives in the foundation of who God says we are. We sang about that earlier, right? We're chosen, not forsaken. We're adopted. We're redeemed. We're forgiven. He didn't give us those blessings so we could be popular, so we could have a good job, so we could have a good family, so we could have a big church. He says, that's not why you live. You are living for my glory. See, how different would our lives be if we began each day saying this, I exist for the primary purpose of giving God praise. That's why I'm alive today. That's my identity. I'm chosen. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. I accept this amazing inheritance for his praise and for his glory. Let's pray together. God, what an amazing passage of scripture that tells us the truth of who we are. God, may we each lean back into that truth. May we lean back into it. And because of that truth, Lord, may we live it out to the world around us at school and at home and in this place. As we go among our lives, Lord, may we live for your glory. God, the breath that we breathe, may it give you praise. May we recognize that we woke up this morning with all of these blessings available to us. Help us to accept them. Help us not to believe the false identities that the world says about us, but help us to remember who we are, to recognize that the eyes of our heart would be opened, that what would come out of us would be an outflowing of that. As we breathe in your blessings, we would breathe out your glory for your name and for your praise. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.